Greetings from the set of Metro and more at Metropolitan Community College, serving more than 50,000 students with over 120 programs at our eight locations in the daytime, evening, weekends, or online. Hello everyone, I'm Margaret Booman and this is Metro and More. More of what you need to know about Metropolitan Community College. Start here, go anywhere. On today's show, we're going to be talking about iPads in the classroom. And my guests today are Susan Trinkle, art history instructor at MCC. Welcome. Thank you. And Kendra Sibernson, physics instructor at Metro Community College. Welcome to you, Kendra. Thank you. So you both were on the original faculty uh, cohort of iPad, uh, the first time users in your classroom. Why and how did you decide to do this uh, kind of teaching with iPads? Well, I began because I wanted to be able to engage with students more. Mm -hmm. And since they um, often come into college with a pretty good background in mobile devices, I thought this is a great way to change up what we traditionally do in the classroom. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Kendra, as a physics instructor, how, uh, how, how does that differ from uh, the students who use the iPads in your classroom? Well, I had a very specific application in mind when mm -hmm. I joined the iPad group. I was developing an online physics class and I wanted them to use the mobile devices as data taking devices. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't expect is in the iPad cohort is learning so much from the other instructors. Like I don't teach art history or I don't right. teach uh, automotive or uh, any of those other things, but I learned a lot of the applications from what they were doing. Okay. Uh, Go back a little bit to the, the instruction that you do on the iPads in your uh, setting, Kendra. You've got a, you talked a little bit before about uh, the kinds of tools that the iPad allows students to use that are applicable to science and physics. Mm -hmm. Well, originally I was looking at using uh, an app called Video Physics. Mm -hmm. So it's produced by a company called Vernier, and that's the company that we use their devices in the physics lab. Mm -hmm. And so what I was looking to do was to recreate kind of the lab experience, but having the students do it in their own home. Now they can't afford to go buy hundreds of dollars worth of equipment for taking data like ultrasonic motion detectors and force probes and temperature probes and mm -hmm. all of these things. But they have some pretty sophisticated equipment in their pocket with their cell phones and their iPads. And within these devices, they have a lot of sensors built into them already. Mm -hmm. So I thought, why not use the equipment that they have, empower them to use their own stuff, because they, they love the technology and they love to use it, um, just have them use that. Mm -hmm. And just starting with the basics, being the camera, mm -hmm. getting an iPad with a camera, being able to video something, the motion of something, and then analyze that motion and try and understand what that means from a physics perspective. Wow. Susan, how, what kind of applications then do you use with the iPads in the classroom? It might differ a bit. Yeah, <laughs> it does a little bit. Um, I use some apps and features of the iPad that mm -hmm. um, allow us to take the curriculum outside the classroom, mm -hmm. which is always fun. Um, but one of the things we do in the classroom um, is uh, use an app called Blendoku. And this was just shown to me by one of my colleagues. Um, Trish Hollins found this, and she said her students were having such a great time with it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things in art history and art appreciation classes um, is that it's a lecture course. And so when we're teaching color theory and how to blend colors and what happens, um, we don't have the paints in the sinks. Right. So you just have to kind of take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> or um, I, c I can pop images of color wheels up on the screen, but this allows students to um, um, see a value uh, scale or see a, an intensity scale yes. um, and actually play around with it so they can get a sense of um, how values change from light to dark. Um, can so you show us? Yes, definitely. Okay. So here's one where this is just a pure um, uh, a black mirror. and white value scale. There, oh, there we, we go. go. Yeah. Look at this. No, it's mirroring. Okay, great. Okay. So yeah, here we have okay. um, some various colors from the color wheel, mm -hmm. and um, we would be putting them together uh, in a way that would <coughs> allow wow. them to see how the colors uh, would mix and blend. And blend. Yeah. That is really cool. 
How did, oh, I'm so glad I got perfect. that. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so they actually uh, do like what you game. just did, right? Yeah, it is it's like, like a, game. a game. And so here's a here's just a value scale of green. Wow. So um, they're mixing colors yeah. and they're just um, like um, also checking and, right. and seeing the various tints and shades of a single color. So what you did is just put them in an order fashion in terms of what? What does it show? Uh, brightness to uh, Well, this one is intensity? a value scale, okay. which means that you're looking at um, the uh, light and dark yes. that's in a single hue. Yes. The previous one was um, was mixing two different colors. Mm. And so since that was red and um, blue, you'd see various shades of violet in between. And then an intensity scale would, would be um, more like seeing a really intense hue versus what it looks like when it's dulled down by mixing the complements. Can you do it again? Sure. <laughs> Let, let's hope I, I can get another one back right. and, Yeah, and show us, uh, right. show us what you're so, doing here okay, when you so do it. On the left, we have what looks like a pure yellow hue. Yes. Um, and then, so I'm going to look for where is the other pure hue up above here. And it looks to me mm -hmm. like that intense red down, down mm -hmm. here so I'm going to put that on that side. So now I can see I've got to find out what's going to happen to that red with just a little bit of, um, of, of yellow, yellow in it. Right. Okay. So it looks to me like it's that. Yeah. And then probably here. Uh -huh. This looks pretty intense too. Yep. And then you can see wow. how that makes a really nice kind of gradient between the, the yellow and the red. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. Do, how do students respond when they're using this kind of thing in the classroom? Oh, they think it's really cool. They think it's fun. Um, they have a great time with it, and I think they realize, um, you know, any of those initial fears they might have of mm -hmm. using the technology, because not everybody has this, mm -hmm. um, kind of go out the window and they're willing to play around with it. It's mm -hmm. also great for them to, um, you know, learn it's okay not to get things right. It's okay to Absolutely. make some mistakes. Yes. Um, and so they know there's, there's no grades attached to it. It gives oh. them time to play a little bit, and I think play is really important regardless of what age you are. <laughs> Play is one of the best mm -hmm. learning tools, Absolutely. too, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kendra, with physics and astronomy, tell us, and sh if, can you show us an application sure. on how you use yours? I also teach the astronomy classes, yes. and um, I'm going to show you a, an astronomy application. There's a lot of astronomy apps out there, mm -hmm. and these are what are called planetarium-type programs. Right. These are uh, showing the night sky. Right. So, like, if you want to go find some constellations or find where the... Uh, planets are. Yes, you can you can do this. The one that I'm using is called Skyfari Pro, mm -hmm. and what's really nice about this is that you can use um, the wow. gyroscope that's inside of here as well as the magnetic field sensor. So it senses north, and what I'm doing is I'm holding the iPad and I can move it around. I can <gasps> look up <laughs> and I can see the zenith there. And right now you can see that the sun is in the sky. Right. Okay, and normally you wouldn't see the stars, but um, mm -hmm. I can forward this over time. Like I can move it ahead by an hour, mm -hmm. or I can let it, oh, that's kind of fast, <laughs> <laughs> have it go forward, and I can see, all right, well, what's going to happen to those constellations over time? And right now the sun is going, and then it's going to set, and then these is other that constellations. Is the belt of Orion in there? Right there is yeah. yep, Orion. So <laughs> Betelgeuse and Rigel, and <laughs> if you wanted to use some binoculars and find the Great Orion Nebula, you could go and, and use it there. And so, like, I can zoom in on my iPad, mm -hmm. and it's really a, a fabulous, there's a lot of cheap and free programs. Mm -hmm. This one's kind of nice because, it well, one, it allows me to, if I'm out at night, I want to use my night vision, and if it's really bright, that's not necessarily so good. So I can turn on a, a red filter here, uh -huh. and so that's really good for my night vision. It's easier to see. Mm -hmm. um, this one also hooks into some of our telescopes, so I can run a telescope wirelessly using this wow. program. And there's a lot of information about the objects in the night sky, but it's a really fabulous application. It seems to me that one of the benefits of using the iPads is that if the student has one, and they can br they can bring all this data home with them. I mean, they can look at it again outside of the classroom. Absolutely, is that right? Yes, definitely. And one of the ways that I like to use it is um, to uh, allow students to take pictures of notes mm -hmm. that we take in class. So mm -hmm. I can. Um, um, show you some pictures of that, but basically um, right now I'm teaching a mural class and I'm co-teaching with an artist and he likes to write notes up on the on on paper, mm -hmm. actually, we're off site. So he likes to write notes on paper and um, after class I snap pictures of it and then I upload it to a Google Doc um, that's shared between everybody in the mm -hmm. classroom 
and they can access that any time. And it's wonderful because then they can focus class time, uh, focus their attention during class on what's being said and the mm -hmm. conversations that we're having. So that's really important. They don't have to worry about taking notes and spelling and all these other things that um, might interfere with them right. really learning. And that sounds like one benefit of using the iPads in the classroom. How, how has use of, of this technology changed your teaching? Oh, it's wonderful for me because um, I, I schedule f a lot of field trips in mm -hmm. my classes mm -hmm. and we always go to the museum. Um, and one of the things that I was always trying to um, do with my, my students is get them to understand the, the magnitude of and the quality of the paintings that are there mm -hmm. um, at the Jocelyn. Since we're not in New York City, the famous things that are in the textbook, mm -hmm. um, um, we don't have at the Jocelyn. But what I do is I pull up the e-text in class mm -hmm. and I can show them the pictures. And I can say, do you remember, um, for example, that this is the Titian that we looked at in class. All of that class content that we've been talking about is right there. And students can use, uh, Jocelyn has Wi-Fi, so students have the iPads in the museum. Um, they have some great mobile um, activities for students to do. But um, most importantly, they can see what we've been doing in class and apply it right there to what's at the Jocelyn. They have a wonderful Titian, and Titian is one of the most primary Renaissance painters in Italy in the, in the High Renaissance. So yes. it's really exciting for students to see this very famous thing um, right in front of their eyes and, and look and see what they remember and make those comparisons from the textbook. Wow. Are, are there many students who, who, uh, who look at the iPad and, and uh, seem to be scared by the technology, or are most, most of them? Uh, pretty tech oriented. Most of my students are very tech savvy. Um, you know, even mm -hmm. if their devices are relatively new, they're willing to try them out. And, and yeah. most of them are very easy to use. A lot of the apps and a lot of the programs are very intuitive. You know, you just start poking around and seeing what happens and then to kind of learn from that. You were talking earlier, Kendra, about an experiment or something that you did in your physics class, sending something to high altitude. Tell me about that. Explain well, that, that is um, part of the, the research that we're doing. We have a little bit of early undergraduate research in the physics, and one of those projects that we're doing is high altitude ballooning. Okay. And uh, we have students design payloads to go on a weather balloon, and we launch it, and it goes to about 19 miles above space. We put cameras on there, we put probes in there, and we measure pressure and temperature. Through and the iPad. Not through the not iPad. Through the iPad. That's okay, a, okay. a separate thing. But it's yes. kind of similar in that it's, it's all remote sensing. You know, it's the sensors within the, the technology. Mm -hmm. So kind of similar to what we're doing with the iPad. Like on our ballooning, we can measure acceleration. And we're measuring temperature. We can't really measure temperature with the iPad. But there's an accelerometer within the iPad. So you could just... I, I wouldn't suggest dropping your, your <laughs> iPad, but if you yeah. had a pillow, you could drop it and you could have it measure the acceleration and then you could start studying gravity. So wow. kind of my emphasis is in getting students to start asking questions. That mm. inquiry-based aspect is really important for me to get students, rather than saying, you have to study this question right. this week, getting them to start asking their own questions. Does this uh, does this lead to a more active learning rather than, and I don't want to call it passive, but it is more passive as you read something and, and, and ingest it that way. Is this more active learning? Absolutely. Yes. Um, there's lots of great things that the iPad does for students, students individually. In um, Can you show that, mirror that image? Yep, yep, it's mirrored now. Okay. Um, S yeah. These are the students in your, what, art history class? Th right this now? is, um, we're working on a mural project right now. So this is a class that's um, gathering ideas and engaging the community t for subject matter that we're going to paint on a mural on the back of, of a south oh. campus in the summer. So we're meeting at Kent Bellows Studio. We've partnered uh -huh. with them. And um, they have the, the monitor, they have Wi-Fi. Um, so all we do is, you know, plug in our laptops and our iPads, and we can project our drawings up on the board. Mm -hmm. um, we had we've had a lot of great presenters um, come speak to us, and so um, we can communicate that way. Students all have some also have some time to work in small groups mm -hmm. and do some research mm -hmm. um, for a presentation they're going to do. Mm -hmm. One of the really great things about this also is the way that um, you know you can. Um, work with differentiation, mm -hmm. which means that you have students who have a lot of different learning styles. Some 
uh, pick up things a lot more quicker when it's tactile and others yes. do much better when they're reading or listening. Mine is visual. Mm -hmm. I pick up things visually and I remember the image. That's how I learn. Right. So this seems like a great way to learn mm -hmm. that way. Yes? Definitely, yeah. And we have um, one of our new classrooms that we're piloting out mm -hmm. at our Elkhorn campus is this um, um, it's uh, called a learning studio, and so we have all this mobile furniture in it, and we <laughs> have monitors on the two walls, two monitors on different walls, and then, of course, there's a screen in the front of the classroom. So it works out perfectly for putting students in smaller groups. So this group can be working on this assignment. Um, another group over on the other side is working on something else. Mm -hmm. And so you can see here we have a group of faculty who are getting trained on this because this is brand new. We've just started it this week, last week. Mm -hmm. Does it may, may sound like a strange question, but does this does use of the iPad help in spatial orientation somehow in art? Um, sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're thinking about um, the space that we're that mm -hmm. we're in, that mm -hmm. we're working in, mm -hmm. yeah. And what we found is that um, using this um, the room where the furniture is yes. mobile yes. makes a big difference in how students engage with one another. They're yeah. more comfortable. It's kind of a warmer setting, so they can um, group around. Um, a single iPad, although that's not necessary anymore mm -hmm. because we can just um, airdrop all of the content to each other's iPads and look at it that way. What does that mean, airdrop it? <laughs> airdrop is just a really handy way to get anything from my iPad to Kendra's. Okay. Um, if it's in range, um, there's just a button you click and, and she can accept it and it wow. becomes part of her iPad. Yeah. So, uh, Kendra, you had mentioned earlier that uh, you have learned things about teaching through iPad from other, from other instructors. Mm -hmm. Give me some examples of that. Like well, what have you learned? In the beginning, been? when we were doing the iPad group, mm -hmm. we were just starting out, we got our iPads, they said, go try stuff, go look for mm -hmm. applications that might be useful and come back and share with the group. Mm -hmm. So we would have this go around the table and share what you've found. And of course, I was excited about the science ones and yeah. the astronomy and the physics and the things that I could measure with it. but. You know, Susan's use of taking it out and looking at images and going to the, the art museum is neat. Um, we had uh, Al Cox, who's an uh, automotive instructor, and uh -huh. so we had some things in common looking at w a wind tunnel application, or there's, uh, like I said, there's an accelerometer in here, so you mm -hmm. can download a seismograph app that measures very small vibrations. Wow. So <laughs> we were just playing around in the office and holding it out. And th my heartbeat was strong enough to be able to measure the vibrations. And so we could figure out what my heart rate was from that. And that was pretty cool. And he said, well, I could go and put that in a car and see the vibrations of a car mm -hmm. and see what's, what's off on that. So, you know, these relationships that you wouldn't really expect to learn a lot from, mm -hmm. uh, we got quite a bit from. And um, other people would be using the iPads in the classroom, having their students show them a question, like a multiple choice question, and then using their phones and voting. Oh, wow. So, yeah. you know, applications that could be used across the board, lots of disciplines. Absolutely. L learning science via the iPad, or via this kind of technology, is probably going to be a growing ever more, yes? Yes. And, and tell me about, um, uh, it, what do you foresee, and I hate to be a, have you be a future prognosticator, but um, how do you foresee this kind of technology being used even more within well, the science applications? Within the science applications, mm -hmm. I think that being able to take data, different kinds yeah. of data, is really amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an inf infrared camera that I use for demonstrations in my, my uh -huh. physics class, so it allows you to see temperature. Yes. And, you know, they use it for houses and seeing where you're losing your energy in the windows and mm -hmm. they use it for you they know use it to spot spot people spot from people from a distance and yes uh -huh. and all of that well this is a rather expensive piece of equipment mm -hmm. i noticed that they're making one to attach to your iphone for a few hundred dollars so how amazing would that be to have like a little an infrared, infrared thing camera that yeah, you can yeah. hook to your your phone or your ipad so I think that as these applications are coming out, we're going to use them more and more. One of the things that I see is perhaps greater use in the health careers. Mm -hmm. I have one application that I think is incredible. You can take a video of somebody's face mm -hmm. and you can tell what their heart rate is. So not mm -hmm. touching, not vibrations, but what happens is the blood flow through your face makes minute changes in color. 
What about makeup? <laughs> I, just I, I think that, that it works, right. you know. Even, uh, even so, right. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's different skin tones. You just have to have yes. a lot of light, but you take a picture. So like from here, yeah. I could tell what somebody's heart rate is. Oh. And so I think we're getting to a point where you could scan somebody right. and then learn a lot about them medically. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think the remote sensing, the sensing applications are going to be incredible mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah. And what about in, in history? Um, how are we going to be seeing this technology used more? Well, I think in a lot of our general education classes, what, what, what I'm noticing is that students are using the tablets more than they're bringing laptops now. And so, we, you know, we originally heard with the iPad and other tablets that these will never take over a desktop, and I still believe that. But for, I th for general use by students and um, maybe even simple use in the home, I think a lot of people can afford a tablet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can do a lot of things with a tablet now. The apps are changing so that some of the things that you could only do on laptops are now possible on tablets. I think they can work um, and, and I don't want to say eliminate, but change the need from a desktop. What, what, is, uh, uh, what does the um, laptop do that the iPad can't do? And one thing I see right away is that, um, and I don't know if this is the case or not, but how do you type on this thing? Well, you can. And you can. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep, okay. it has a keyboard, and it's, it's all, it okay. comes in the, the very bottom. Mm -hmm. um, students are usually pretty good with that because they're used to texting so quickly on yeah. their phones. Um, but you can easily dock it to, or, and link it through Bluetooth oh, to a keyboard. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, now you have the voice activation, so you can just talk sure. and have mm -hmm. it transcribed. I, I should have thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Behind the times here. Um, what have we not covered in terms of the applications that you both might use within your classrooms? Can you show us any other applications that we haven't gone over? I can show you the, the video physics that I use. I'd love to, yeah. Video physics. Yeah, so um, the first semester of general physics mm -hmm. uh, tends to look at motion, you know, like yes. a moving object and velocity yes. and how fast something moves and acceleration and two-dimensional things. Mm -hmm. So um, I can perhaps... We have uh, your, your iPad is on, on the right. There, there, it, there it is. Okay. Okay, so this is a, a video that that came with it, mm -hmm. and I hit forward, and I've already taken the data for this. What you can do is you can take the circle and then just tap, mm -hmm. and then the frame goes forward at 30 frames a second. So if you know the size of something on here, yes, and velocity is distance per time, mm -hmm. so if you know distance and you know time, mm -hmm. that's your frame rate, you can figure velocity. Wow. So I went through here, I'll, I'll play that again, you can see those blue dots yes. following the basketball. Yeah. So now, I can come up here to graph, uh -huh. and it shows me the X and Y coordinate system, and then I can come over here and I can look at that straight line going up in the X, mm. and I can see that it's in the Y direction, I have kind of like a parabola in right. the Y. And so then it's getting students to kind of understand what it means graphically from the video. But I think the exciting part from this comes from them taking their camera and then starting to ask a question like, how fast does my dog run across? Or how fast is that car going? Or how fast so is... So they could use their iPad to take uh, it, yeah, video? Yeah, so that's what the lab is, is wow. getting them to use this equipment and start asking their own questions. Because yeah. I think that's where we're, we're kind of lacking in a lot of the science labs, mm -hmm. is getting that creativity and getting students to start questioning and asking scientifically. And it's a difficult thing to get them to start doing, but I think it's a really important one. But once you start using these kinds of tools and y you just take them out into your own world and begin exactly. asking those critical thinking questions. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Did you have something you wanted to show us on yours? Well, one of the apps that um, is, is becoming kind of standard on our MCC tablets is Explain Everything. And um, It's called Explain Everything? It's called Explain <laughs> Everything, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so what, what it is, is it's a whiteboard, an interactive whiteboard, and you can um, upload pictures, mm. you can draw on it. Did you draw this I on did. I online. drew that yeah. online there. <laughs> um, I put this together to kind of help um, others see how you can create an um, online portfolio so uh -huh. students can do all of their work um, and share it with each other and with the, with the faculty members. So yeah, if I grab the um, um, pen tool, it'll pop up there in a minute. There's a little bit of a lag yeah, between yeah. this. But 
um, if I go forward through different slides, um, I can include um, other pictures. You mm -hmm. can embed video. You can embed oh. music, all sorts of, of different things that you can put into um, the iPad into your presentation, and then you can record the whole thing. So if I wanted to do um, online what mm -hmm. I'm doing in my class, I can just record um, um, me explaining whatever, it everything to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the students and upload it. And then they can take it home and look at it as many times as Absolutely. they want to. Absolutely, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's the beauty of using this tool. Exactly. Do, you, do you plan to, to incorporate more learning on the iPad system in the future? Both of you? Absolutely. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and especially for the online classes, I think it, it really oh, yeah. gives them an opportunity to, to use their own equipment. Mm -hmm. And I think that in the, the sciences, mm -hmm. the science classes that I've offered online, I think we're moving to a BYOD environment, a bring your own device. Mm -hmm. So yes. using your cell phone, using your, your iPad. For, for people like me, it's uh, first I need a tutorial on how to do it. But yeah. <laughs> but um, use, using technology more and more gets you less afraid of it as well. Yeah, sure. And exactly. I'm not saying I'm afraid of it all, but it just takes time to learn, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so what is this picture of? Um, well, one of the things that we talk about a lot mm -hmm. here is how to use an iPad, how it can be helpful when you don't have a classroom full yeah. of students. Um, using iPads if you don't have the cart. Yes. Um, and so we have a lot of um, faculty who are looking for professional development yeah. tools. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I love to do, especially being an art history instructor, mm -hmm. is to go to museums and take photographs um, when allowed yes. of the labels that give me the information about mm -hmm. it. Another thing um, we that's have... That's the Jocelyn that you That had. was the yeah. Jocelyn, yes. Right. So um, <laughs> that's about as far as you can get to take a picture of the special <laughs> exhibition yeah, right, that's right. up now, but there's some <laughs> students um, at that, and we're at the Jocelyn uh -huh. there. Um, but there is, um, I was just showing Margaret this image here. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look too exciting maybe to um, anybody else, but for us it is because one of our adjuncts was um, up in Ohio and he was kind of doing this tour of some of the, um, the mounds, Native American mounds, mm. and so he got to take some pictures and record the man who was explaining it and bring Very it back to the students. Cool. And you mm -hmm. can see it right there on right. the iPad. Well, I want to thank both of you, Kendra Sibrinson and Susan Trinkel, art history professor, physics professor. Thank you for being here, both of you. And thanks for being with us on Metro and more. Our goal is to help you learn more about Metro Community College's mission and leadership. We're so glad that you joined us. And I'm Margaret Booman, your host for Metro and more. Thanks for being here. This has been a MetroVision production produced by Metropolitan Community College. For me, Metropolitan Community College was a very reliable choice. All the credits I earned at MCC easily transferred over to UNO, where I completed my bachelor's degree in education. Now, I am an elementary school teacher right here in Omaha. Ahora, soy instructora en un programa de dos idiomas. Metropolitan Community College has delivered quality education to the metro area for 40 years. The reliable option is Metropolitan Community College.